Eh bien, mesdames, messieurs, chers amis, toute l'équipe FIC. Est Good morning, heureux. everyone. The FIC team is very happy to welcome you today for this plenary session. Welcome to all of you who have joined us today. And uh, thank you for those who have joined us yesterday. This uh, morning session is very important because we'll, you, we'll listen to Guillaume Poupard first. And then we'll have a round table with um, Ms. Gesteger and Didier Tisser. And the uh, president will intervene as well. I would like to welcome the authorities present here our friend from the cyber campus, Michel Ollenberg, and all of those that I can't see because I'm quite in the dark right now and I can't see you all. But there is someone I would like to welcome. He's humble and he hiding. Louis Pouzin, a pioneer of the internet, I would like you to uh, give him a big round of applause. Louis Pouzin. Louis Pouzin. Dear Guillaume, thank you for remaining loyal to the FIC. I will now give you the floor. Bonjour à tous. Good morning, everyone. I'm very happy to be with you today. I think it's the 10th time that I have the occasion to be present to the FIC as a DGA earlier, and those 10 years have flied. And a lot of things have happened since the first edition of the FIC. First, if we had to use KPIs or indicators, I'm not sure we would get a good rank because in 10 years, a lot of things have evolved and threats, mainly attacks, the intensity of attacks, the global level of stress put on our networks. And I think that if we hadn't done all of this work, it would have been even worse. I will not go back to the threat that we are facing today because you all know this threat very well, but it's still very worrying. I've talked with a journalist yesterday and he was quite provocative and he told me, I don't understand because the ANSI is trying to minimizing the threats. And if it's true, well, I don't know what's happening in reality because we are not minimizing the threats. We have analyzed the landscape of the threats for 2021. It's a very good article. And fundamentally, we have an increase in cyber criminal attacks, which is very rational. They want to have lucrative attacks that are not dangerous. And so attacks are less visible, and fingers crossed, I hope that uh, we have, we are now way ahead of the hospital attacks, for example. But for a lot of economic actors, economic actors that are vital for our economy, these attacks will continue to happen and are very serious. And we also have to look at all the directions we can, for example, think of Costa Rica. The Costa Rica is in an emergency state for different months now because of woodnals and people that have disappeared because of the war in Ukraine. But threats are very active. The threat is very dangerous. And the worst of the threats is the one that we don't speak a lot about, espionage, state espionage that we have to cope with. It's extremely serious. It has a lot of impacts, serious impacts on our economy, on national security. And when this capacity will be used as a weapon, as a destruction, a source of destruction, this threat will become even more destructive. So we are not minimizing the threats, but we have to keep in mind that the best is yet to come. And on that day, we'll be able to rely on the people who have prepared to face those attacks. And we need to have a look at three different directions. It's, so it's complicated, I have to admit. But we really need to focus on those three directions. 
First, the European direction, the national direction, and the territorial direction. And then everyone will get specialized, and everyone has a role to play, an added value that can vary depending on the different levels and directions we are talking about. But this is our ambition today, to be able to work on those three different levels. First, the national level, and I think we started with this direction first and foremost 10 years ago. I don't want to uh, give you an observation of what have happened those last 10 years, but I think we can remain satisfied with what has been built with the critical operators, with the uh, industrial ecosystem that goes hand in hand with the critical infrastructures. We need infrastructure to get secured, but we also need people to get those infrastructures secured, potential threats, and the state is also a vital player, and this is what we've built those last 10 years, and we need to be proud of it. So that's the positive feedback I wanted to share with you. This industry has developed the solutions as well. In 2021, we had 323 visas that were emitted by ANSI, 255, well, it it depends on the people, like, as the figures do. But we had between 200 and 300 advisors, and so it means that we have a lot of services and solutions that were developed in France. So we have to stop saying that we have to look for solutions elsewhere. Of course, we can have a look at what's happening elsewhere, but we do have solutions in France. The ecosystem is also paramount, the ecosystem that we are building this ecosystem is present today at the FIC, and it gets materialized with the Cyber Campus. I would like to thank Michel for the work he's been doing with his team. And this ecosystem will save us. We need to work together. We will not have the same means as our competitors, but we do have the means to work with different profiles, different know-hows, but with the main and same goal to get as much security as possible and to defend ourselves from the attacks. And I think that we really need to rely on the work that we've been doing together. So I would say that this national direction is going well. But when it comes to pressurize all the ministries to make sure that they can secure the administration, we can say that we are relatively optimistic. If we want to have a look at the territorial and European directions, I have to say that a lot of work has to be done. I'm not saying that nothing was done. We had a lot of work that was carried out at the normative level with the Cyber Act to develop certification schemes, the development of visas as well. Those last few years, we have been working on regulations, and it translates the new state of mind that regulators have. And we wanted to know who was going to take the lead, the European Commission, on the member states. What about sovereignty, for example, autonomy? Today, we're not there yet. We are trying and find solutions together. And during the French presidency of the uh, European Council and with the uh, negotiation of the new NIST directive, we've seen that HUAP is making progress with one pathway and with one common ambition. This directive is paramount, and I'm going to enter the details later on. But at the parliament, the European Parliament at the uh, European Commission's level with the DG Connect Department with Thierry Bouton and its cabinet. From the uh, member states' perspective, the goal was to remain ambitious. We knew it would be hard, but we had to work on this to find a new perspective and a new approach because we need this regulatory tool. And this was the experience that we went through with the first NIS NIS directive. And when it's well done, it can be used as a catalyst to save time. This new directive will be a game changer. First, because it's a wide scope directive, because a lot of industries and sectors are 
covered by this directive. We have critical sectors, we have the energy sector, telecommunication sector, the energy sector, the logistics, the uh, event sector, the Olympic Games, for example. These are critical sectors that are also targets of cyber attacks. So this new directive will help us help those different areas, the different sectors, the public sector. It will not be a, a huge change in France, but it will help us move forward with local municipalities, for example, to do even more progress. And we have a lot of actors involved. It's not an objective per se, but it's still important. And we'll have a lot of actors will, will be covered by this directive. And the goal is not to use this directive as a burden. The goal is to help the actors. That's the main objective. And it's something that we saw a few months ago when we realized that it was too serious, the cyber attacks carried out against hospitals, for example. And so we've decided to identify 130 hospitals that would be centers of reference, and it went well. Of course, we were coping with the real attacks, and so we had to see what was happening on the ground and what was happening in theory, but 90% of those hospitals were very constructive and saw this directive as an opportunity to make progress. On the European level, we have a lot of issues going on, for example, on regulated operators. And we also have more subtle issues, more complex issues revolving around European solidarity. And this solidarity is key. But we really need to implement this solidarity in practice. We really need to focus on what's happening on the ground. How can we help member states when they are going through difficult times? How can we help member states and use our strength? But are we ready for this yet? We have decided to encourage all the member states, whatever their sizes, whatever their positioning, whatever their industrial base, to develop their capacities and to strengthen their capacity, and it has been done. All 27 member states have strengthened their capacities in an ambitious and interesting way. We also had to create a network for the cooperation group, the NIS cooperation group, the Cyclone group, which is the brand new network created with the member states, and those networks are working well. The goal is not to say, OK, we're working together. We are working together on the ground. We have networks. And it's a positive aspect of the work that we've carried out. And how can we help each other? And the main element that we need to put into the equation to be able to solve the equation is the private sector. Companies which have all the means necessary and to adapt to the needs and what's happening in the present is vital. This is the message that we've been repeating to our actors and to the European Commission. We really need to also think of the cybersecurity issues on the operational level with private public cooperation. This is how we are going to solve issues. This is what we've seen on the cyber campus as well. So there is an essential dynamic and the war in Ukraine needs to be seen as a new opportunity to carry out this dynamic. What's the role of the NATO groups? What's the role of the European Commission? But these are details. What really matters is the ambition that we have. So we have the third direction, the territorial direction. It's complicated to talk about territories because, to me, it's a term from Paris, but we know what it means. We've seen concomitant attacks, criminal attacks that are sometimes very simple, but with dramatic consequences. Cyber attacks carried out against hospitals and local communities. And those last few months, we were lucky enough to experience something that was quite unpredicted using money coming from the recovery plan, 36 million 
euros initially and 76 million in the end to see how we can use the strength that we have, the elements that we have to use the money that we have to help the local authorities. We've been carried out amazing work. We have implemented the right dynamic to make sure that things would work. And we also have cyber security pathways. You have an issue. You don't know how to solve this issue. That's completely normal when you are running a hospital. You don't know what security, cybersecurity entails. Of course, when you are the director of a local community, it's very difficult. And so we have to help those players. How? By putting money on the table. 140 million euros, depending on the infrastructures, so it can be a lot or not a lot at the same time. Then we take stock of what happened, we carry out audits, we focus on the interactions, and then we start working on the plan. And it's working extraordinarily well because motivation is here. So we really have to support those infrastructures with professionals from the private sector to go into the right direction. And after the recovery plan, I don't know if we can talk about reserves, but there are 1,000 local and public actors that were guided and supported to go into the right direction and to use cybersecurity measures on the long one. And this model is paramount, and it is working. We have also developed the model of SSRT. It's working well. We have teams with operational knowledge, teams that understand the threats that are mobile and that can look for the resources where necessary, teams that we can call when we don't have issues yet and when we do face issues. And it's a very good balance between benefits and risks and costs as well. We can use this model for public and private sectors. We have an association in France gathering those teams, those SERT. And we're going to continue working on those teams within the regions as well. Our ambition is to use the recovery plan to start and initiate SERT teams at the regional level. Of course, we need to work with the whole ecosystem that needs to go into the same direction. And in all regions, we really need to focus on the sectors that are left behind in the cybersecurity area. What can we do when we're facing an issue and who can help us? So we have trained those teams, we have incubated those teams as well, and I really think that those teams will be vital to mitigate the gaps. We also have another team leading the way that is sometimes also way ahead of other companies. And so we really need to use those teams to create consistency and cohesion within an ecosystem that is gathered around the same topic and theme. And maybe that the sect maybe the sectors and regions will have too many resources, but then we'll be able to rationalize the, uh, the system. But we are far away from this situation. We don't have to forget also the overseas territories during the pandemic. The overseas territories were severely impacted by COVID-19, and so we really need to work with them. And we really have to have in mind what we can do, upstream solutions to face cyber attacks. A few words to conclude my presentation. What should we do on the short term? There are a lot of things that we need to do. First, we've been talking about this for a long time now, but we have never managed to implement it in practice. We have. We need to have a strong national awareness campaign. I'd like to be able to talk about people, to talk about cybersecurity to people for five minutes. 
five minutes to share and convey the essential messages around cybersecurity. What is digital security? What are the ambitions that we have? You need to also to go to cybersecurity.gov.fr if you have a problem. We really need to work on this from primary schools to care homes. And instead of saying, OK, awareness campaigns do not work, we really have to focus on this. We need to forget money. We really need whatever our positions in the public sector, in the private sector, in the media, we really need to work on digital cybersecurity for five minutes and to talk about it for five minutes to everyone. So I wanted to put that on the table and really hope that's going to be possible one day. Second thing, we are now going towards a cybersecurity as a service strategy. What can we put on the market as services to help actors? The United Kingdom has always had better ideas than us and before us. Offering services to fight against very specific topics that in the end complicate the lives of cyber attackers. These line of services will be developed over time. We are trying to identify cyber attacks. We need uh, antivirus platforms that are sending all the files to Google, if possible. Silly things but that we still have to do anyway. We need to work collectively and we need to develop services together. Human resources as well. It has to remain our priority, number one priority, training. This is going to limit us in the future. There are a lot of initiatives like the Cyber Campus. I've talked with Cyber AG. We have a lot of initiatives going on. We also need to focus on training. Trainings can last for years and months. We need to train people to these beautiful jobs and positions. It needs to remain a priority because it's going to be a limitation for us in the next year to come. I'm not going to develop those topics into detail, but I really think that we need to develop all the different elements of cybersecurity prevention, offensive measures as well. France won one of the first country to empower itself with specific measures. And I would like to thank partners, Susan UC4, first and foremost, because we've been working with the uh, DGSE, DGSE, DGSA. You don't hear a lot about what we're doing because it's a close environment, but we have strong capabilities. We are working on all different elements of the cybersecurity area, and the goal is to get respected. How? Well, with a strong position on the uh, geopolitical level, on the political level, Henry will have a lot of work, and his team as well. And we also need to tell things in an honest way. We have this image, France, which is quite shy, but it's completely false. I think France is a strong country in this area. But we are not going to follow our American partners. If the sole objective is to talk about the topic, we need efficient measures. But you'll be sure that this topic will come over. And the most complex topic, because I've been talking about, it's very simple, we know what we're talking about, but the, the topic of sovereignty, on which we've been hearing a lot of fibs, uh, but there's also uh, many solutions um, that could be uh, very positive. The topic of sovereignty is not security, but it's a collateral topic and it should be an obsession to talk about sovereignty. An obsession in the way that 
not as a caricature. The idea is not to eliminate what could look like a foreign bit of code. Sovereignty is mastering our destiny in the cyber more than ever. We need to master our destiny. I will not say any further, otherwise I'll go uh, over time. All is left to me is to thank you. Uh, I've had incredible years, fascinating years with you in your respective roles. It will remain extraordinary for me, an immense joy and luck. When I said 25 years, I said uh, the advice I was given at the HR at the time, I said, oh, but very quickly you'll have to do uh, serious things after this. Quite, uh, I'm quite happy I didn't listen to this uh, HR department. And honestly, what this has become is just incredible. Thank you very much to all. Merci beaucoup. Bonjour, bonjour et bienvenue à tous. Et bienvenue. Good morning, uh, welcome. Welcome to this first plenary session of the FIC. I, I will have the pleasure to uh, moderate uh, these uh, plenaries for this FIC. And welcome to all of you here. Uh, in this room, but also uh, used behind your screens uh, remotely. You have simultaneous translation, uh, so this is available in French and English, and you also have some headphones, and you can choose your channel uh, on the web. So I also invite you to uh, react on Twitter with the hashtag displayed on the screen at the moment, and we shall have, during this plenary session, Gilles Rapaport, who will illustrate live the discussions and will uh, offer uh, designs and drawings. I wanted to announce that we have the pleasure of welcoming the Vice President of the uh, European Commission and the President of the Haute France region, Xavier Bertrand. So we're going to start. So I invite our panelists to come and join me on stage. L'Union européenne s'est très tôt illustrée par une production juridique et normative conséquente. Le RGPD a ainsi inscrit la protection des données personnelles dans l'agenda international et incité de nombreux États à aligner leur propre législation. Même chose avec le Cyber Security Act, qui a défini un cadre européen de certification de cybersécurité potentiellement applicable à tous les produits, services et processus numériques. Pourtant, la puissance normative n'a jamais suffi à faire émerger un géant politique ou industriel. Et l'Europe reste encore un nain numérique. Elle ne compte ainsi que 74 licornes numériques, contre 177 pour la Chine et 488 pour les États-Unis. Cette domination est particulièrement flagrante en matière de cloud computing. Les Américains AWS, Microsoft Azure et Google captent 69% du marché européen. Même s'ils progressent, l'investissement en cybersécurité reste également largement en retrait en Europe. Dans ce contexte, est-il possible de faire de la protection des données personnelles et de la cybersécurité un véritable égalisateur de puissance numérique pour permettre à l'Union européenne de jouer dans la même cour que les États-Unis ou la Chine Ou sommes-nous condamnés à la dépendance Diplomatie, politique de la concurrence, politique de défense, politique industrielle. Quels sont les leviers à mobiliser pour transformer l'essai et parvenir à l'autonomie stratégique numérique You have seen names uh, displayed on the screen, so I'm going to introduce our panelists today to we'll start with uh, Daniela Schwarzer. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Schwarzer. Thank you very much for being with us. You're the Executive Director, Europe and Eurasia of the Open Society Foundations. Bonjour. Good morning. I also have the pleasure of being next to me, Mr. Ari Verdi, Ambassador for uh, Digital. Olivier Onidi, you are General Director of DGO. And Cyril Dujardin, you are... Head of BDS and Head of Digital Security de la Société Atos. Bonjour à tous. Good morning, everyone. So let's have an observation. 
Europe has been uh, producing a lot of uh, laws on cybersecurity. We have our uh, GDPR and more recently DSA, DMA and CRA, Cyber Resilience Act, but also the regulation in terms of fighting cyber crime. And uh, Olivier Lidi, uh, this is the scope of DG Home. Where do we stand and what is the regulatory uh, arsenal uh, as we speak today? Well, thank you very much for uh, this question, this introduction. I think that the, the summary was probably uh, too short, and thank God Guillaume Poupard in his introduction will have corrected the image of what uh, the European Union has done so far. It has gone way beyond. Of course, uh, the standardization uh, is uh, something that has a lot of momentum with great results you've just mentioned. But I think that beyond the uh, standardizing uh, aspect, we've implemented, and I would like to uh, talk about what I know best, which is uh, what is being done in terms of cybercrime, in terms of justice and internal affairs beyond standardization, we were able to implement and structure cooperation and coordination, which has now become natural. Before that, we had to push the players to work together on a topic such as fighting cybercrime. It is by default the uh, European level which is uh, actioned, and Europe was able to implement innovative tools, uh, agencies, major agencies, of course, of cybersecurity, such as uh, ANSI, and these little brothers and little sisters, and also uh, NSA, but we also have in spe specific sectorial aspects, we've implemented agencies that develop skills that are made available to all authorities of the member states and allowing the pooling of certain tools which are often scarce. Uh, for example, in terms of deciphering, it is uh, at Europol that we've developed a uh, decoding deciphering station which is available to all European partners. And it is also within Europol that uh, the cooperation in terms of investigation is organized with specific objectives in terms of cyber crime. And it is part also within Europol that the skills on intervention and identification of uh, crimes in the dark web uh, world. And also, Europe has invested a lot to lay down the strong principles of liability for all uh, players. Uh, Guillaume Poupard talked about uh, empowerment in terms of analysis of risks and protection. Beyond that, we also went quite far in uh, the principle of obligation of cooperating with uh, the police forces and national authorities in terms of supplying information, taking decisions, developing skills as well in companies and uh, administrations, working also as a group to identify the illicit contents with strong laws, uh, including one on the terrorist content was implemented yesterday, was came into force, and the obligation to remove notified uh, contents, and also recently a proposal to uh, fight uh, pedopornography uh, online with extremely strong obligation, not only to remove the contents, but also to develop capacity to identify the known contents, new contents, and even uh, practices of uh, grooming and others. And another example is that of uh, training. And Guillaume Boupin was actually quite uh, clear on that. In the world of justice and internal affairs, this is still uh, it's even harder to develop and recruit skills, talents in that uh, business. And Europe, through its agencies, through programs of development, have helped uh, thousands of players in the Ministry of Interiors in France and act active forces, such as gendarmerie and police, to develop skills and, as a network, help us 
protect ourselves, but also uh, answer investigations. Thank you. Ambas ambassador Verdier, you are the ambassador for uh, digital affairs. What is uh, digital diplomacy and, and what is your outlook on the various uh, recent actions? So whether is it going to reinforce the influence of the European Union? Well, thank you for this question. I've often asked because uh, digital diplomacy, we don't even know what diplomacy is. So uh, myself, including I asked the question to my new colleagues, and one of them said, diplomacy is pursuing war through other means. So you have to realize that the French diplomatic network influences as positions, uh, intelligence, you name it, but not through uh, force. So you have this extremely wide spectrum, and within that, the uh, French diplomatic network, you have this digital revolution that disturbs international relations, becomes a confrontation in international relations, and sometimes is determined or threatened by international relations. So the states want to control that evolution, and uh, you have uh, some uh, really some contention about the future of digital, where Europe has a singular voice called the third way which I think is the first way, because Europe is the uh, birthplace of the digital revolution uh, of open standards that have founded uh, the internet and other things we can see. So in digital diplomacy, you have economic development, the promotion of certain values. You've, you can often hear talk about the uh, French-speaking world, but what would be there? would be the world if the artificial intelligence doesn't understand French. Why does it, does it mean uh, if we have to work in English because uh, AI doesn't understand French? And then, of course, the cyber war, the uh, conflict in cyberspace, which is something we'll talk about today and especially during this session. So within all this, of course, and I'm answering your second question, Europe and uh, is the space of power that we need. It's an internal market that is wide and powerful enough for anyone should take into account uh, this internal market and its capacity to project and negotiation and dialogue, which is incredible. So we've been, uh, to conclude, to define uh, digital diplomacy as an exercise, it's an incredible network. You have about 20 different teams in Kedorset that has to do with digital uh, diplomacy, and Guillaume mentioned that. There's enormous uh, inter-ministry coordination, and uh, we create European consensus, and then we can project. So it's a permanent consultation work. And then you have the European framework in this, and to conclude, uh, this year was very, uh, very fruitful, this NIS directive and then the Digital Service Acts and the D Digital Market Acts, which had been prepared through enormous consultation. And the French presidency really committed to implement them and contribute to uh, the timeline that surprised, actually, uh, oops, Servitory, so it was... Uh, uh, faster and less controlled than anticipated. And I'm very proud to promote these major laws, which are actually go and find the structuring principles to do that, but a sustainable uh, legal aspect. I worked on the TSA, maybe I'll uh, finish on that. This is the regulation of social media and therefore uh, fake news, hatred, uh, violence, uh, terrorist contents. And faced with that, there were many errors possible. Doing nothing would have been a catastrophe. Some people are in danger uh, faced with this hatred. Trust the companies. Uh, we don't need to audit you. We trust you. Everything is fine. Would have been a crime in terms of democracy. And entrusting the state to decide on the contents on sites would have been uh, Orwellian uh, dystopia. So the way we've invented in Europe of world's first to create a framework 
of compliance, as banks would say, or where companies will find solutions and have to uh, report to uh, in uh, authorities of the solutions with a dialogue like uh, the one you've been having with the banks, with a go into logic of continuous improvement is a European answer. That was for DSA, but for DMA it was the same thing. We also uh, had a monopoly of digital. It's not characterized the same way as a monopoly uh, in uh, the old economy, because not the number of outlets or market shares, but there are ways of taking power which are different. And of course, the Nice, uh, the nice direction, Directive, uh, Guillaume talked about, uh, I don't know how he said it, but we call that uh, deep defense because we are equipping ourselves the capacity of mobilizing the economy and mobilizing all together to build security. Thank you. Well, thank you. I'm now going to talk to uh, uh, in English. Uh, there's now a, a, cons a consensus. No, you can speak French, but I think we're good to speak English. There's a, a, a consensus among European countries uh, to work together, and more and more countries are adopting RGPD-like legislation, um, having understood that it's essential to continue trading with the EU. Um, California, of course, but also Israel, even China. Is this, can, can this be considered as a, a display of power on the part of, of Europe, having succeeded in influencing uh, the, the behavior of its partners or adversaries through regulation? Is this display of power? Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, it's a great pleasure to be with you from Berlin this morning. And uh, I'm sorry that I can't be in the room. So, I think it is clearly a demonstration uh, of power in a certain sense, but definitely uh, of the attraction of Europe as a partner for other countries in the world. And I do believe we have developed our own thinking over the past years very substantively when it comes to the question of framing our own debate on cybersecurity, admissible also digital and technological competitiveness um, in, a, in a geopolitical way. So today the question of how other regions react to Europe's standard setting is no longer only a question of uh, market access and how, you know, how does it play out for our own export of technology and digital services, um, but it is very much part of a normative competition that is developing more fiercely as we speak between Europe and other major players in the world. China is definitely to be named as a principal one. Um, but there's, of course, also Russia, which has essentially locked off its own uh, internet and has gone towards standard setting, which by now are incompatible with European norms. And then we have the United States as a key partner on the one hand, but to some extent as a regulatory competitor. If you look at the differences across the Atlantic with regards to the use of data, um, so re regulation of that matter, or other aspects, it becomes very clear that we are not entirely on the same page. But if we look at the way uh, the geopolitical setting is changing, and the more we see a division of the world into a, let's say, Western liberal technology sphere and an authoritarian one, it becomes very clear how big Europe's interest is uh, to work closely with the United States and the new uh, tech and digital council that has been set up between the EU and the US, in my view, is a very important contribution. I wish to underline one point uh, that Guillaume Poupard mentioned uh, in his introductory remarks, um, and that is really how the thinking has moved from the national level to the European level very recently. And it is very important now, I think, to define the concept of sovereignty, not as a loss of sovereignty if we cooperate as Europeans together. But it is really a regaining of sovereignty, both in terms of regulatory power, which is already there, but then also with regards to technological competitiveness, which is the base for our regulatory power in the world. And then um, thirdly, based on that, really our capacity to shape rules beyond 
a single market and thus extend our influence very much based on the normative principles that we share and protect within the European Union towards our neighbourhood and other regions in the world. Thank you. So I'm now uh, talking to you, Cyril Dujardin. We have a proliferation of uh, norms and standards, as we said. Is it enough and is it necessary? Isn't that a, an extra constraint for organizations and even more so for the large ones, especially for the small ones? Well, I must be masochistic or maybe because I'm French, but uh, as industrialists, we are in favor of norms and standards. But the simple ones, the ones that can be used, understood by us and our customers and clients. Uh, to take the three levels that Guillaume was talking about and uh, to go an extra notch, as industrialists of uh, cyber, we have to address three levels, a national level, European level, and international level. At the national level, these standards and norms are crucial. They help us, they guide us, they guide our clients on which type of standard or technology certification we need. Then, as soon as we go up one level, at European level, as European players, we realize that the market is not yet a multinational European market because the translation of these standards and norms, even though is we have interoperability and exchanges, has not yet, and that's the principle of Europe, has not, we don't have yet a standardization of the whole chain, so as player, we can be positioned, and the way we process a topic in Germany would be the same in France, cybersecurity, cloud, you name it. So we have this difficulty as the European players to go or to scale up. I'm talking about Atos as a large company. I'm thinking about my colleagues in smaller structures and startups who want to scale up to European level have this significant complexity. And then the third level is the world level, the global level. Are these regulations, would they allow us to be competitive worldwide? Well, at least it allows us to be competitive in Europe, which is a good start. Will it allow us to be competitive in the world? We're not there yet. We talked, Henri Vernier talked about diplomacy. I think that there's a, we managed to create on our territory, in our environment, a uh, a protection, a standardization of both of uh, citizens, our industries, and our governments. I think that we have to use all the digital diplomacy we have to impose or use to the maximum these diplomatic weapons. So these standards are not just European standards, but also uh, standards and norms that are international. If we are not a big enough player on this in Europe, all the European players will remain European and not world global actors, players, and we would have missed our capa initial capacity. Now, the proliferation of norms, isn't it con counterproductive? Uh, like too much regulation kills the creativity or presses startups and YouTube? Let's have, let's watch a video on this. Deux façons d'y répondre. La première, c'est de remarquer qu'en fait, la contrainte peut aussi être un atout pour l'innovation. Il y a des, des secteurs industriels, notamment, qui ont été particulièrement efficaces pour, pour faire des innovations nouvelles quand on a ajouté des contraintes. Je pense au secteur automobile, par exemple, où bah, quand on a imposé des contraintes sur la, la sûreté des utilisateurs ou sur la propreté des, des véhicules, ça a permis des avancées technologiques euh, qui n'aurait peut-être pas eu lieu sans la réglementation. Le deuxième axe euh, pour répondre à cette question, c'est euh, de réfléchir à quel est le type d'innovation auquel on veut assister. Certaines nouvelles, euh, nouvelles technologies, euh, particulièrement euh, au, niveau, euh, au niveau du tracking euh, publicitaire euh, ou euh, de, du tracking qui peut être fait sur les réseaux sociaux, qui permet euh, 
aussi le tracking politique. Est-ce qu'on veut que euh, nos technologies puissent être utilisées de cette façon-là ou est-ce qu'il ne faut pas avoir des, des restrictions à ce sujet Si on regarde ce qui s'est passé sur les, sur les 50 dernières années et qu'on qu essaye un petit peu d'en étudier les causes, ça a l'air d'être plutôt dû à, au manque d'investissement dans des, dans des petits acteurs. Si on compare avec les États-Unis, il y a des lois, par exemple, sur les, euh, le fait que les, les États doivent forcément avoir un budget dirigé vers des petites structures et des nouvelles structures. Ça vient aussi probablement euh, au niveau de l'Europe d'une euh, culture de la peur de l'échec qui est beaucoup plus présente en Europe qu'aux États-Unis euh, et d'un manque historique de venture capitaliste euh, qui fait que euh, bah, c'est beaucoup, euh, beaucoup plus difficile de créer des nouvelles, euh, des nouvelles entreprises en Europe qu'aux qu États-Unis. La réglementation n'est qu'une problématique assez mineure dans tout ce paysage. Si on continue à se comparer avec les, les États-Unis, on voit qu'ils sont, eux, en train d'étudier également les possibilités de réglementation, euh, que ce soit au niveau fédéral ou au niveau de certains États des États-Unis. Je pense à la Californie, qui a adopté des lois très proches du RGPD euh, au niveau de la protection des données individuelles. Et on ne peut pas dire que la Californie est un État qui manque d'innovation. On a aussi euh, Amazon, qui euh, a de lui-même fait un moratorium sur la reconnaissance faciale à l'usage de la police. Il y a aussi des entreprises qui utilisent euh, la réglementation comme un, un avantage compétitif. Euh, par exemple, DuckDuckGo qui euh, fait sa publicité sur le fait d'être un moteur de recherche qui ne traque pas ses utilisateurs. On assiste en ce moment à quelque chose qui semble être une crise de confiance généralisée, qui est parfois imputée aux réseaux sociaux. Et à travers les réseaux sociaux, c'est aussi les algorithmes qui maximisent le temps de rétention, sur lesquels on pourrait aussi imposer des régulations. Donc quelque part, euh, c'est aussi un serpent qui se porte la queue. Euh, mais par ailleurs, je pense qu'il est aussi très, très important pour, euh, pour garantir la confiance dans l'économie numérique, euh, d'avoir beaucoup de vulgarisation et beaucoup d'éducation. Et il faut surtout s'éloigner de, de cette pensée magique qui fait croire que tout est possible et qui est, je pense, un, théo, un terreau des, des théories complotistes. Je pense que toutes les industries euh, se sont un jour confrontées à... La, la problématique de prendre en compte des régulations et toutes les industries se sont, se sont régulées. Ce qui paraît nouveau dans l'industrie numérique euh, est en fait quelque chose qui est arrivé dans toutes les industries. Euh, on n'accepterait pas que euh, les restaurants ne soient, pas, euh, ne soient pas surveillés pour les mesures d'hygiène. On n'accepterait pas que des nouveaux avions soient testés directement par le grand public euh, avant d'être euh, euh, estimés être sûrs pour le transport de voyageurs. Il euh, n'y a pas vraiment de raison que euh, l'industrie numérique fasse un, euh, exception à ce niveau-là. Euh, la problématique principale, c'est que le législateur comprenne bien les enjeux et la technologie et agisse dans l'intérêt du public. Dr. Schwartz, I'd like to turn to you. Um... Norms, norms themselves will not allow Europe to rid itself of its dependencies and guaranteed sovereignty, even though they do help. Uh, other levers must be mobilized uh, to act and be influential on the international scene. For your part, you've developed the concept of smart sovereignty. Could you shed some light on that concept? Well, yes, I'm very happy to do so. so and we developed this as um, a contribution to Germany's foreign policy debate, but in my view, it applies to any EU member state. So we looked at what Germany, before the last federal elections, uh, last September, what the new government could be doing in order to regain sovereignty, which we deem countries of the European Union have partially lost because of global developments. And the approach we took was to say, they should together think about regaining sovereignty on the European level in the, in the best possible way, because going it alone will basically get them nowhere, given the increased competition we see between major world markets and definitely uh, the European Union and its single market is a key player 
uh, if we look at the way the world is regionalizing and we see China, we see the US as major players, and then the EU is definitely a third very important player in this. But we have to do what we can in order, in order to strengthen the European Union. So what we basically argued was that every single member state should reconsider to what extent um, governments think about sovereignty as being something that can be assured nationally or can only be regained in a European way. And in my view, uh, the technology and digital sector is one which exemplifies uh, this uh, need. First of all, we have spoken now at length uh, during this past hour about the progress the European Union has made with regards to setting norms and standards, not only for itself internally, um, but it has been able to export them and make them a substantial matter, for instance, in, in trade negotiations. Um, then secondly, uh, technological competitiveness. It's not only uh, that companies greatly benefit from a regulatory framework across the EU single market and it makes them more powerful. Also, competition policy may need to be reviewed if the relevant market is considered to be the EU internal market only, then we end up with enhancing competition within the European market, but we may not have the very big players um, that can compete internationally. And thirdly, I believe that the area of research is crucial also, first of all, because of, of scale. If Europeans work together more decidedly, I know a lot of programs are already in place, but I do believe there's a potential to lift. If you just look at the number of national AI strategies, at the number of other uh, tech, future tech relevant strategies, if Europeans started to do this, uh, in a more decided way from scratch uh, on the EU level to add to what has already been put in place by the European Commission and then to think through what are the conditions for uh, research, um, for instance, based on, on data that some European companies or even universities right now have to do in other regulatory spaces because they can't do so uh, within the EU. Some go to the US, some previously went to China, although it's now more and more difficult to be present there. I think there is a very strong case to be made to really think about tech and digital sovereignty as part of a broader approach to sovereignty on the European level. Just one final word, and this um, also goes back to uh, something that Guillaume Poupard said in his introduction. Um, the necessity to work uh, in an all-government approach to really bridge the silos between economic and tech policy, competition policy, defense and security policy, and then also uh, the big questions relevant for the sustainability and uh, resilience of our democracy, which doesn't only mean norms and standard setting and the digital sector that is compatible with our democracy, but also the thinking about how our vulnerability in the tech sector can a digital world can actually affect democratic resilience. These are key elements uh, upon which the EU has to work together across uh, the different areas of competence, but also national governments have a lot to do to really integrate their approaches and become even more strategic. Absolutely. Uh, je me tourne vers vous, Olivier Onidi. Olivier Onidi, we have norms to fight against cybercrime that goes beyond the responsibilities of the states and the European Union. What concrete response can the European Union implement today? In terms of cybercrime, we need concrete responses, and first we need to understand how the cyber attackers work, what are the measures that they use. We also need to implement tools at the national level. We also need to organize our cooperation, cooperation between the different agencies of the EU. And we also need to create a normative framework so that responsibilities of the actors are clearly identified we also need to facilitate cooperation at the European level for investigations and to also open the legal pathways. 
there is a strong debate around the direct access of digital evidence. We know that digital evidence is vital for all investigations going on today. Instead of using very complex cooperation tools, we need to give the possibility to all authorities to get a direct access to digital evidence to free ourselves from limitations in terms of jurisdiction, in terms of allocating the data as well. So we need to have very clear principles. We need a legal representative who has the obligation to deliver data and information that is requested. Among the uh, levers of power, we have the diplomatic toolbox, and there are a lot of actions that are being implemented outside of the legal perspective. Can you share a few examples with us? I was told to be quite concise, so I will try and be as brief as possible. When talking about digital sovereignty, I like to say that, yes, on the international landscape, we have different definitions of sovereignty. In some countries, sovereignty is the right to oppress the population. There are some countries that really want to be hegemonic on a strategic perspective, and in Europe, we quite agree on this. We want to be strategically autonomous. We want to be free to make all the decisions that affect us. And in our imagination, sovereignty is synonymous with democracy. And to us, sovereignty is about the sovereignty of people. And it's a very important reminder, because with such a project on sovereignty, and to add on what's being said this morning, Cybersecurity needs to be articulated. Everyone can spy on you. You're not sovereign in the cybersecurity field. We also need to have standards. You need researchers, you need companies, small companies, artists. And if you don't have all of the actors playing a very important role, you'll be followers and not actors. We also have the uh, normative power. I have created myself three companies, and there is a debate around standards. Can standards be negative for creativity? One year ago, I've met Indian creators, and they've told us, we really want to implement those standards, but we want to use the standards to create economic value. And to do so, they have created consent management systems to implement the GDPR and as well to nourish the economy. And finally, if we think in Europe that sovereignty is about doing what we want to do and to be free, France also thinks that we need a dedicated policy on what we share. This is the essence of the internet, but the internet is about open data, is about open software. And so when you're operating in a shared space, there is no boss. It's a simplified vision, but it's a European vision. And a lot of people have mentioned this already. And so there is no rivalry. You are freer. And so if you're freer, your neighbors can be freer as well. And so you can export in other continents foundations, bricks that can emancipate countries. In 15 days, we'll have the digital assembly taking place in Strasbourg, and we'll read the conclusions of the report gathering 18 countries so that the European Union becomes the uh, space for shared visions. I would like to mention the fact that we have adopted one month ago a strategic vision, and it's really important on the geopolitical level to say, OK, we are present, we are going to defend ourselves, and we have carried out a lot of work to better understand how we can 
block our links in terms of relationships at the European level if we are attacked. And there is also cybercrime in Ukraine. And for the first time, the European Union has recognized by giving evidence that it was a Russian attack that had a lot of consequences on our territory. Guillaume thought that we were quite shy or disorganized, but we were the first countries to share evidence and to recognize Russia as the culprits. Power is also about military power, and we've talked about cyber defense a lot, and we saw an example of this in the drawing. What's the role of the European Union in this field? I'd like to open this debate, and I would like to uh, welcome on stage Mr. Tisser and also Mr. Henri Verdier. You can sit down if you want to. So, Mr. Tisser, coordination is vital. So, what mechanisms are existing today and how do you implement those mechanisms? France was very active in the field of cooperation. So, what are the mechanisms into place? We've talked about networks. Guillaume Popa have talked about networks, and those networks are paramount beyond the entities that respond to specific needs. What is really important is to share information. And so today, within the framework of the French presidency, we have tried to focus on the creation of those networks and the tools that are currently being implemented as well, and to make sure that these tools can bear fruits. So beyond the French presidency work, and I have to say that it's very important for a country such as France, but the context of the uh, Russian war in Ukraine has shown us that within the framework of military actions, cyber actions are also very present upstream during the war and after the war, even though some people thought that a lot of things would have happened on the cinetic level as well, and even though a lot of people have died because of the conflict. To me, there are three vital elements, three pillars that we have to remember. First, the attribution of the Russian attack. This attack was perpetrated to make sure that the uh, Russian, to, the Ukrainian forces didn't have access to their resources. So there is a strong link between SERT teams, military teams, and military teams are present to be part of the European missions. And there is a strong concept that was created in May to better organize those elements. So there is a strong link between this SERT, military SERT, and this national SERT team. Trust, confidence is also a strong pillar at all levels, and more specifically, within the framework of the commanding offices. In France, we led the creation of networks through yearly forums, one in January and one that took place yesterday in the uh, offices of the EDA to be together physically and to exchange on our individual issues that are collective issues as well. It was also an opportunity for us to share our perspectives and what happened within the framework of the uh, 
war in Ukraine. We also wanted to give more energy to all of the projects, the PASCO projects, and there are a lot of projects going on, and a project that is led by our German colleagues, a center to manage all of this data and information, because today it is vital to be able to anticipate the attacks, to share information, to get the global picture of what's going on, to get a vision of what's being done by our enemies, and to get a clear picture of our means. So these are the three pillars that are vital. Of course, we've worked on those three pillars with our colleagues, and it was vital to give more energy to these strategies. Better ensure cooperation uh, among member states, especially when crises arrive. General Tissel mentioned trust and building trust and exchanges. Um, what do you do to better to cooperate as best as possible at the European level? General Tissel also mentioned the military certs. Um, how does this? How do you? How do you promote? the best possible coordination between member states. Well, thank you. Thank you very much also for the opportunity to, um, to address cyber defense cooperation in this forum because we see the need, we see the requirement and also a lot of opportunity to, to increase uh, cooperation, to reap benefits of, of that cooperation. Um, and of course, during the French presidency, we have also already now, which General Tissier made a lot of good progress in establishing that, uh, that forum uh, of cyber commanders as well. Now, um, of course, exchange of information, uh, cooperation in the, in the defense uh, domain uh, due to its sovereign nature is, has its certain challenges, and of course, this is very much true for the, for the cyber domain. Um, in the civilian side, we, we know that uh, uh, a long way has, has been already made in establishing mechanisms for cooperation between uh, civilian certs. Um, so cooperation and communication channels has be, have been uh, so far less developed in the area of, uh, of mil certs and, and military uh, cyber defense operators. So against this background, in 2020, the, uh, the defense agency took uh, the decision to, to build a dedicated initiative, uh, the mil cert interoperability conference, or make to demonstrate the added value of cooperation uh, to mil certs, but also to, to identify what was needed to make sure that uh, military cooperation in the area can be facilitated. So um, this forum, this conference, provides a framework where we can um, experience, observe the dynamics of incident response during uh, realistic live fire cyber attacks so as to identify gaps and opportunities for improvement. So. The, the MIG concept was conceived in such a way that uh, it has used military planning strategy similar to, to what is used in real uh, cyber military operation. And, and in a way, we have uh, wanted to also push uh, the participants out of their comfort zone, make sure that, uh, um, that there is really a, a very direct involvement uh, and realistic exercise environment. And, and it has been a very uh, positive uh, response to this. Uh, we have uh, over 200 experts have participated from more than 20 uh, member states. And, and, and there's been concrete output in developing this further. So we just yesterday, we concluded the, the second edition uh, of, of this conference. And, um, and indeed, very important that we take the lessons learned and further develop this, this concept. So um, we are therefore now also launching work towards the establishment of an operational network of meal certs, uh, which will then, uh, let's say, consolidate, solidify this platform. And, and we will develop tools, uh, procedures to enable info, um, uh, efficient information sharing, also, also referred by General Tisser, um, and, and the best practice uh, also in identifying the network, the, the colleagues in, in, uh, in defense actors over the, over the time. So um, a lot of opportunity to increase opera cooperation here, and we are making good progress. While recognizing, recognizing the difference uh, between cyber defense and cybersecurity, how best to leverage the synergy, synergies with EU cybersecurity initiatives? Well, we are, of course, aware that uh, a lot of the technologies are dual use uh, in, in, in cyber area. Um, and um, there is truly a mutual interest uh, we see between civilian and military actors in developing 
cutting, cutting edge technologies for Europe for the future. This is a shared task and we just need to be most efficient in, in doing that cooperation together. So we do see a clear convergence of efforts uh, to develop master uh, disruptive technologies such as artificial intelligence and, and, uh, and quantum uh, also in, in, the, in the area of cyber. So there is a clear objective to pursue a, a truly EU-wide approach and um, also this is reflected already in the 2020 EU cybersecurity strategy that we need to work across all communities to this end. Um, there is work, of course, between us in the, in the European Defence Agency with the European Commission to make sure that there is a link between the activities there and the research effort in particular that is conducted in the Horizon Europe programme, um, in our view, uh, will we'll need to be looked very much from uh, taking into account the defense requirements, the military requirements also, because there is a truly mutual benefit in, in that. So now also with the establishment of the Cyber Competence Center and the development of the, of the work, um, uh, there will be important to coordinate and, uh, and our own uh, military defense capability strategic research agenda should also then feed into that, that discussion. So a lot of opportunity uh, and, and to just use and become effective in using the different instruments because ultimately it is cybersecurity by different actors for, for all of Europe. Oui, ce qui est important, c'est de ne pas réinventer la poudre. Hein. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We mustn't duplicate on the military level what's already existing on the civil level, of course. The battlefield is different. The cyberspace, the digital space is the same, but the perspectives are different. And today, because of the uh, war in Ukraine, there is a high intensity battlefield. So we need to get prepared for high intensity. What does it mean? Who will be involved? We're also talking about information wars. There is a huge conflict with dedicated means to support actions on the ground. We talk a lot about regulations limiting certain uses and in France, we focus on the use of social media by military actors. We need to make sure that they do not share any pieces of information that could be used by the enemies. And in Ukraine, military actors are participating in this war and they are feeding into this information war to make sure that the population adhere to the war and to make sure that they can be supported. So what is really important today is to benefit what has been done in the civil world, in the digital world. It's evolving very fast. But we also need to have a military perspective to better understand what's going on. We have talked about the uh, NIS directive. It's very important, of course, but we also need derogations so that we can maintain a high efficacy on the ground. Of course, we need to comply with the international law, but we don't have to restrict our military capabilities. We don't have to restrict the role of police officers. And this is what we are doing today all together so that we can integrate in the directive this specific vision. We are integrating this aspect upstream. And this is quite innovative. So we want to also focus on confidence and trust. Thank you very much for participating to this session. Thank you. Thank you so much. We also have another lever, industrial processes. And I'm going to go back to Dr. Schwarzer, if she's still with us. Do you think Europe is ready to consider its power in terms of interest, economic interest, and no longer in terms of values. Is Europe ready for that? 
Well, first of all, I don't see a contradiction at all uh, to have a values-based approach uh, towards the challenges we are facing and defend our interests. For me, this is really, um, this goes hand in hand. And I think all of our discussion today made very clear that we are seeking uh, protection and security. Uh, we have moved on with certain steps and the issue of attribution, which came up twice during today's discussion, is, is essential here to be, you know, more outspoken about attacks and, uh, you know, in, in a way make statements of our own interests to protect ourselves and attribute the attacks to, to actors out there. Um, those are important moves. Um, when we speak about economic developments and competitiveness, certainly uh, we have uh, very strong interests to be a stronger and more resilient, more competitive player in the world, uh, to develop our own industries, to gain market shares globally, um, and to make sure uh, we have the players that can ensure that's also for, for future technologies. But at the same time, we have spoken uh, most of, of this panel about the regulatory framework, which enshrines the basic norms and principles uh, that uh, the EU stands for as a regulatory space. Um, in particular, um, the uh, question of data regulation, of cyberspace, of internet uh, freedom, and also the protection of freedoms in, on the internet, if we look at the way how we need to deal with hate speech, uh, Russian and Chinese propaganda, and other ways of distorting reality. It's very clear uh, that we have strong interests and that they are very clearly values-based. Now, is the EU ready for this stronger interest-based element in all of this? I think we are getting there. Ursula von der Leyen, our Commission President, came in with uh, the theme of heading a geopolitical commission and uh, let's just remember, this was a while ago. Since then, many things have happened. First of all, uh, China has become ever more present uh, within uh, the EU in Europe's neighborhood. We are concerned about uh, a you know, more tedious relationship between the United States and China. So Europe has to situate itself in that context. And Russia's war in Ukraine has definitely upped uh, the geopolitical uh, necessity for Europe to act in a more coherent and a more strong way to defend our interests. So not everything is solved, of course, but I think the direction is clear. For me, um, with regards to the debate on European strategic autonomy or European sovereignty, I think the essential thing to worry about is not the big concepts, and there is a vivid political debate on which is the right one and what does it actually mean. I think what we really need is capacity to act. And that means, first of all, uh, joint analysis and uh, the strategic compass was mentioned, la boussole stratégique, a very important step forward for Europeans to align their analysis of the strategic situation out there. Um, and then based on that, a stronger European cooperation to provide the means and instruments to actually be capable to act. And the third element is, of course, the decision-making capacity. And there we know that in the field of foreign policy and defense, there is no majority vote, but it all goes by unanimity, which is why, in my view, the future of European cooperation will be in smaller groups, as we already see today, because the world is moving so quickly around us, and Europe has to both defend its fundamental norms and interests. It needs to be able to act quickly and swiftly, and if the 27 don't go along together, it is up to a group of member states to move first. Thank you, Ambassador Verdier, je me tourne vers vous. Comment est-ce qu'on passe d'un soft power juridique à un plus... How can we move on from a soft power, an economic soft power, to normative soft power? And how can we become a giant in terms of cyber security in Europe? Bon, c'est bien, c'est pas tout à fait ma, mon mandat, donc je vais être très court. En revanche, vous le savez, j'ai créé plusieurs startups, j'ai créé un pôle de compétences. I created a cluster, so it brings back memories. Uh, I will say just a few things. Uh, we remember uh, sovereignty is a whole. If there is not a creative uh, power, we are beaten. So we lose. So it's important to remember that the standards must be reflected upon the same time as the economy of innovation and security and probably defending a certain model of uh, digital. We're not rushed, running after the uh, 
the others uh, running second is uh, loser. So we innovate. And there's something that's, that's been striking me. We talk about the power of Silicon Valley. We talk about the consumer internet. So it's really a small part of the internet. And that's the vertical integration of uh, targeted uh, ads. So really uh, the uh, smart cities, connected health, uh, driver, driverless transport, uh, there's still some uh, places to take. And Europe has got a tradition, and just tradition. So personally, I think that we can say we are going to take strong positions on the emerging battles and I haven't talked about the technology themselves. I think there's some technology that's so critical we cannot just be absent from the cloud, for example. But then you have the emerging uh, technology where the entry ticket like uh, quantum uh, technology. And to conclude, I'm uh, now looking at the cyber uh, SMEs here because now look at the landscape. It really reminds me what I created a cap, cap digital with friends, uh, so the cluster for the digital industry. I discovered an incredible network. France is really a great country for animation, for special effects and gaming, video games. And we had a network of uh, SMEs who could not uh, hunt as a group. And we, were, we had the world leaders of small niches and the difficulty to integrate that in consistent offers. So we've worked on that, especially having with shared back office, offices, and suddenly the ecosystem in the Paris area ended up the only one in the world to manufacture uh, Hollywood uh, feature films. And, uh, Lorax, or there were major uh, films made in Paris with uh, by a coalition of uh, SMEs. When I see the cyber world, it's exactly the same thing. We have world champions in many, many different businesses, and uh, you shouldn't be a herd of cats, but rather work as a pack, and you'll be a world power. Mr. Jardin, how, how do uh, how can major players help the smaller ones uh, sustain innovation. Well, it's not what we can, but we should, because as a world player, we need all these smaller players, because the world of cyber uh, security is evolving so fast that we're not in a position, we, as the large companies, sustain, support all this innovation and all this. And just like our enemies are organized in uh, industrial way with startups and SMEs and so on. We have to be organized the same way. And I agree with Ambassador Verdier where SMEs and startups should learn how to get structured, hunt as a pack, and see how this works. And this is what we are here for. We are here to help them, educate them, see how do, how do we work, how do our competitors, our major competitors, impose a number of uh, codes in cybersecurity. It doesn't mean that we should apply the same codes, do the same thing as them, but it only means that they have standardized in terms of marketing, instead of R&D, instead of partnerships. How do we address uh, customers? And uh, they have this model, this mental model, so we we have to understand it, and that's what we're here for. We had to help them finance. We are here to push innovation. We have this uh, FIC uh, startup, uh, so a uh, strong network is going to be awarded, uh, the FIC award. So this is what we can do to push number of uh, companies like that. We have been talking a lot about uh, sovereignty, but sovereignty is not enough. Is why should I choose your technology? Because it's sovereign. No. Great. I mean, uh, there are some uh, technology that is not sovereign that is going to be uh, that fulfill the role and have guarantees of uh, protection of data, security protection that are much higher level. So sovereignty is not enough. Beyond that, we, you must provide something different and be different. So this is very important to continue 
animate all this. But I think that in France and Europe, we really have the whole ecosystem. Uh, we are going to talk about the uh, cyber campus, but this is uh, the living proof that we can associate to be in an emblematic and iconic place. And the market is not French, it's not European, it's a world global market. So together we have enough for all players to be together and be present on that market. I'm going to stay with you because Henri Verdier said we cannot uh, give up on critical uh, technology, but like the American cloud, we know is 70% of the European market. Uh, do we let them go ahead or uh, should we try and catch them up or should we go uh, like uh, on tomorrow's uh, technology like quantum, for example? Well, we shouldn't uh, give up. Uh, we have to support it, secure it. We have to have a second cloud. We have uh, approaches like that. We have to uh, take advantage uh, to develop the, the cloud players in France and Germany who don't necessarily have uh, the, uh, the, the, the size of the major players, but they have the, some specific skills that can be used by the late, uh, major players. In terms of technology, we need Europe to choose their battles. We cannot be present everywhere in the whole chain of value from components to quantum. We have to, knew, to know how to choose the battles. We have to know how to develop industrial uh, sectors. And we have to stop scattering uh, the financing. There's a possibility to develop some true players in a number of new uh, industries like the quantum, but we shouldn't uh, sprinkle uh, the finances on uh, hundreds of uh, players. As Europeans, we have to be in a position to develop one, two, or three uh, players and not have one in each country. You have to accept to have this ambition, this will to have the capacity to uh, overtake the train that's already ahead of us. Now I'm looking at you, uh, Olivier, very quickly. What is your vision within five to ten years of uh, cyber crime uh, in Europe? Well, they all connected and all uh, encrypted. How do you see the situation? Well, we must learn of uh, to better understand opportunities with uh, technology in terms of uh, civil uh, security, we are still lagging behind. So these are uh, players who have not invested as much as in the military. Uh, to, we have to appreciate and define the requirements of technology to uh, serve the objectives. Now, second, uh, we have to uh, learn how to better appreciate the, the risks that are connected to that. And a great example was the collective work that we've uh, completed on 5G, not following the American diplomacy, but rather have a true collective analysis of risks and benefits uh, of 5G and then implement uh, some programs to mitigate uh, these risks. Hence, hence the importance, uh, uh, the importance uh, of uh, cybercrime, and uh, we need to have more. We need a more political will to uh, add a, a layer on certification. Uh, we are not there yet. We have many things. Uh, and we need to, to uh, do what we've done. we are doing in other, in the older economy. We are in the world of uh, safety, security by design. Well, let's do the same thing in that. That's exactly the same instruments as uh, those that can be uh, used. And we need to strengthen our capacity to have a European certification that is credible and unanimously recognized and ask 
resort to standardization. Now, in terms of norms, uh, we have to continue uh, thinking a clever legislation. And uh, I was happy to hear about the uh, positive association, about the framework legislation suggested at the European level, which is a very good example of what we've done in terms of encryption. We have lost nearly five years, wasted five years defining whether we should define or use a backdoor or uh, vulnerabilities and so on. So uh, we've set the legislation in terms of obligation of results and not in terms of means. Be absolutely neutral in terms of technology and, uh, and just simply last example, uh, latest example on inscription on, on uh, child pornography, you are free of your own uh, choices, and if you want to use uh, the encryption for men to end, but you have exactly the same obligation of results. So it's up to you to develop the means. So you need to develop the means to, so that in an end-to-end -end encryption environment to obtain exactly the same results. So a last aspect, because it was a light motive of all the intervention is cooperation between the various players. We need more cooperation between uh, the civilian and the military, the public and private, and uh, some uh, hurdles exist. It's up to us to remove them. It's not easy, because in cooperation, we're talking about exchanging information, sensitive data. So it's up to us to act on these aspects. But we need more cooperation than what we have. So I think a positive aspect when you see what is presented to us today in uh, the uh, exhibition hall, I think we can be very proud of what is being done and what is going to happen looking forward. And the cybersecurity is not at risk in Europe. This is typically an area where we demonstrate our capacity to org get organized and think about the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. And on this, we're going to conclude our panel discussion. I'd like to thank Dr. Swatcher. Thank you very much for having been with us. Henri Verdier, Cyril Desjardins, gentlemen, thank you very much. And now I'm going to welcome Commissaire Vestager. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. You are uh, welcome. Please take a seat. Well, thank you for starting in, in French. So thank you for being uh, with us in the fact for this uh, 2020 edition. For, for a very long time, a very Open Europe has been promoted, uh, in which the policy on competition was primarily designed to benefit consumers, and designing the industrial policy came second. Today, and we heard it, you know, there's a real evolution on sovereignty, on cooperation, and there's a real need for an industrial policy. How does the Digital Markets Act fit into this approach? Well, Europe is a, is a complex place with a lot of strength. And, uh, and one of the things that we have learned uh, during the pandemic, uh, and of course with war uh, back in Europe, is the vulnerabilities that comes from just-in-time and single supplier dependencies. Uh, and actually, uh, competition is good for resilience, to have more suppliers, but also to have more customers. If one customer fails you, that there is someone else and you can go to. So, uh, competition, trade, openness is not an enemy of resilience or strength. Um, what we may have, uh, have to reconsider, and, and I hope this discussion is in every boardroom, uh, is indeed how to make sure that we uh, do away with single supplier dependency. That we actually do have a buffer if things happen. 
because we, we see that, uh, in particular, just-in-time has entailed a risk. Uh, we also see that our, maybe, greed for cheap Russian energy from semiconductors heavily supported from Southeast Asia, uh, from raw materials uh, being uh, provided for without, I think, a lot of care for neither workers nor the environment, that those risks have now materialized, so we need to reconsider. Part of that is a business discussion. Part of that is a societal discussion. And here, bringing into place both the Digital Services Act, that gives obligations uh, as to how services can be provided in our digital reality, but also the Digital Markets Act, making sure that it's your ideas, your work ethic, your fun funding, that gets you to market, and not a gatekeeper who decides. That, of course, also provides for the many European strengths to get fully into play. We mentioned it. Uh Two, more than two-thirds of the, of the cloud market is in the hands of U.S. players today. Um, isn't this domination anti-competitive? I mean, how can we, what can be done to bring in European players on this market, for instance? Well, first and foremost, uh, you know, I need to do my job. Uh, when people uh, complain and say we have real concerns about how the big players, uh, they play this game. Of course, we would start investigation, we would look into this, we would uh, push, uh, we would open cases uh, if we find that there is a reason to do that. Second, to open the market. Uh, in the data act uh, that has been tabled, that is now negotiated uh, in Parliament and in the European Council, you know, we provide for cloud switching. So that when you sign up with a cloud provider, that in that signing up, you also create yourself opportunities to shift to another provider. Because your needs may change. You may want to have a different quality in, in your cloud provision uh, so that this is possible. And, uh, and last but not least, to say, well, it's absolutely legitimate that you have different uh, demands from your cloud providers. For instance, that sensitive government data can be um, in a cloud offer that is secure from third-party uh, um, jurisdiction. Uh, but of course, uh, at the same time, developing uh, the data market so that different cloud offers uh, will be uh, available. Our, our European market has 400, 450 million consumers, uh, nonetheless a single market, but very fragmented. What can we do to consolidate this European market and promote the emergence of a fully functioning European ecosystem and no longer, no, not these side-by-side the -side players that we, we, we discussed earlier? Well, the, uh, the fact that it is a fraction is one of my deepest concerns. Uh, because we saw that, you know, in the first chapter of digitization, we didn't provide for a digital single market. Uh, we didn't provide for the kind of funding needed to, to scale up. So those who we now know as hyperscalers, they scaled in the US market, uh, access to available risk-willing funding uh, with basically Spanish and, and English as the two main languages. Uh, of course, we've been repairing, uh, but we're still not there. Better funding options, a better capital market, a more digital single market, but we still need to push. And, and here we need to discuss some of our European fundamentals, that you can actually trust another pro a cloud provider without that being from your own country. Um, because then the many providers in parallel, they can come together uh, and present maybe stronger offers from stronger players. Uh, and I, I, of course, we welcome that. It's not for me to take that kind of business decisions as to who you would want to, to create a joint venture with or to merge with. But, but of course, there is space for that in a European context. We already know that the implementation of the DMA in a timely manner might prove difficult. Uh, we're asking, you know, from moving from an ex post to an ex ante regulation, which means uh, the necessity for adoption of new tools and new processes to comply with these obligations. It's thought that the three-month notification period will begin in 2023, but already we have companies uh, for whom it's going to be a requirement that are making their voices heard and thinking this is coming a bit too fast. Uh, could this be the beginning of a, of a wider move 
to slow the implementation of the DMA, the Digital Markets Act? Do you see this as the emergence of resistance? Well, I have seen everything. <laughs> You know, and, and even with the Digital Markets Act, I, I, we will not be unemployed. There will be new games played. Um, but we are, you know, we are on track. And we also see companies coming to us saying, this is what we think. Is, can you give us guidance as to how we could be compliant uh, with the Digital Markets Act? And we welcome that a lot. Uh, open doors policies, you know, it's not even formally voted through Parliament and Council yet. Uh, but open doors, please come because uh, we're, we're, we have an urgency here. And they may say that it is fast. I'd say, well, it's almost too late. Uh, the timing could not be better. So everyone will have to make a real effort so that we have compliant companies by the beginning of 2024. A, a, a true European industrial policy has been the subject of debate, including uh, within the Commission itself. Today, it seems like there's a more aligned position. So how would you describe, what is the shared vision? How would you describe the shared vision of, of Europe's industrial future? It's good. Uh, it's also very promising. Um, because what we, what we do now is that we are much more ambitious in addressing market failures. Uh, we consider it a market failure that there are no large-scale uh, semiconductor um, um, FAPs uh, in Europe. So based on the treaty, so with no new rules, uh, no new provisions, but based on the treaty, we sort of open a window for uh, assessing first-of-a-kind projects. And that could mislead one to think, okay, then only one. No, it's indeed a window because we also want first-of-a-kind uh, to be in competition with one another when we get to large-scale production. That, I think, will be a big win. Also for the ecosystems, because what we want to achieve with the CHIPS Act is that many more businesses, they get the design capabilities, that they think about chips as part of, of their product, of their services, of how they want to do things, so that the entire ecosystem is, is being lifted uh, by these endeavors. It will take a very close involvement by the business community, otherwise none of this is going to happen. Uh, because actually the Commission had similar ambitions back in 2013, none of that materialized. Uh, and I think the reason for that lack of success was the fact that there were no sort of business responsibility on ground. Without that business buy-in, also for investment, none of this is going to happen. Second example would be on batteries, uh, for cars, for many purposes. Here we have a giant project uh, businesses developing the next generation of batteries, but also developing the digitization of batteries. So the battery will tell you, I can be recharged, but also I can only be recharged for storage of energy, or now it's over. I want to see myself in another battery. Uh, and because of that, also a European sort of recycling uh, system. And that has enabled that now the investment in batteries are bigger in Europe than anywhere else on this planet. So, with a combination of uh, openness to the world, competition, and really ambitious projects with multiple countries and multiple companies, uh, we can change the trajectory of Europe. Openness, competition, and ambition. Margaret Vestager, thank you very much. It was my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank for you very much. Me. Thank you. Thank you. Je crois que nous avons un dessin euh, qui venait euh, conclure notre panel. We have a, a drawing coming uh, about. Uh, uh, here we go. <laughs> it's maybe strange, but high performance. I'd like now to welcome and give the floor to Xavier Bertrand, for, uh, who is the president of the Haute France region with uh, Jérôme Angouard. Mr. President, from the origin of the FIC, the Haute France region has been our support, and I would like to uh, thank you for uh, con this uh, continuing support uh, from the uh, Haute France region, which is very important for us because when the FIC was created in this area, 
the idea was to uh, remove the silos between the military, the civilian, and uh, thanks to thanks to you, this adventure is uh, still going on. So you have the floor. Well, we're first going to. Uh, it is thanks to you, General, that this idea became a project, a project reality. So a round of applause for for you. You deserve it. Well, and also a round of applause to those who make it possible every year to make it a success. We just seen the uh, vice president. I think of Guillaume Tissier as well. The program is always uh, very dense, and I'm, as a local elected member, I'm always inserted in, in this uh, schedule to talk about only a few items. But the FIC has now become a reference event. We are proud of it. And what we also want to do is not to be uh, an event, a place of exchanging, but it is, that it is also for the region to have, uh, the, to see the birth of an ambitious ecosystem. And I wanted to insist on that. For several years now, you have allowed us, you have given the idea of Accelerate to implement a whole ecosystem on cybersecurity. And this year, this is going to materialize into the labeling of the first cyber campus that is on this territory here in Haute France. You had the Paris area, of course, but uh, the Lille Metropole cyber campus is going to help us with this unprecedented place dedicated to uh, digital security to reinforce the, uh, the playing between the various players, private players, public players, researchers, non-profit organization and all this within the same place. So it is another step towards positioning Eau de France on this strategic aspect of cybersecurity. But let's not make any mistake here. It is not time to stop and look at the cyber campus. And Bernard will talk about the role of the Lille metropolis on this. No, I'll state clearly this is not enough. And we need, as far as we are concerned, to go faster. Because every day, the liberal, liberal professions, uh, shopkeepers, SMEs, local authorities, including smaller cities, are being hacked and attacked. And most of the time, these players are more or less alone in terms of response. And these attacks have increased in many areas. So let us raise this question. What would happen tomorrow if a large-scale attack would be organized with these targets? I know that we're going that to a different level to the various previous speakers, but it is important as well to imagine that when tens or hundreds of thousands of companies and private individuals are hit by a massive attack of uh, ransomware, then our country could be stopped paralyzed. And if we're not prepared all together in case of IT pandemics, companies, private uh, individuals and uh, could be left alone, this, this is unthinkable. The state could not be everywhere at the same time. And in this perspective, I know that I'm pushing the idea of a republic of the territories, a better distribution of roles between the state and the local authorities, but also a better articulation of responsibilities between the various players. And this could be the opportunity to give, be prepared for these attacks. So very clearly, a distribution of roles, an articulation of roles, should be done as fast as possible. So in this region we implemented, and I did talk about it to those who were here for the previous uh, edition, a uh, regional plan for cybersecurity with concrete uh, programs, not just for larger groups, but also for SMEs in this region. First of all, the diagnosis in SMEs, also uh, some training aspects of uh, cyber contacts in SMEs, the idea being to equip our companies with internal resources that is aware, trained for the challenges of cyber attacks. And so we'll have a complete ecosystem with this campus. The region has always wanted to have a strong partnership with the ANSI organization to develop the uh, response center 
for cyber attacks. But all those, those measures need to be accelerated because the measures and the attacks are increasing. We need a public policy and we'll need this trusted partnership between the state and the local authorities so that we can all have the right tools to control our security measures and cybersecurity of our players. I would like to leave the Autrans region for a while. We all agree that cybersecurity is a state responsibility, and so the government has to make all the necessary decisions and to protect French citizens from those attacks. From 2007, with Nicolas Sarkozy, we started to give a cybersecurity approach to France. And contrary to the UK and the US, the decision was made to give this responsibility to the ministries and to the prime minister. Offensive capabilities were given to the Ministry of Defense. ANSI has then grown a lot, and he, it's expertise is widely known around the world, and it has helped us ensure the security of vital operators. We also have standards and norms that have been drafted on the European level, and I would like to congratulate Guillaume Poupard for the way he has been piloting this agency for eight years. We are very lucky to have him at the head of the agency, and I really wanted to thank him for all of his work. With François Hollande, we have consolidated the initial model. The Prime Minister was in charge of the strategic policy in 2015. With the first mandate of Emmanuel Macron in 2018, we really wanted to use functional chains that were allocated to the different departments, intelligence and military departments and defense departments, I think we really have to implement a new strategy and to also assess the results of this strategy to make sure that we are able to overcome the challenges of today and tomorrow. I think that we need to go back to the inter-ministry approach. The prime minister needs to be in charge of the national approach. The missions of the uh, ASIMA program needs to be consolidated, and we also need to regroup laboratories for cybersecurity, and we also need to prioritize this aspect. I'm not an expert, even though we are all passionate about what's going on, and because of the context of the war in Ukraine, we have different and multiple geopolitical contexts that show the real intentions of some players in the cybercrime area. We need a strategic space, and we have now an emergent and an urgent objective. We need to go faster. We need to go forward to create a safer digital space for Europe. You need to invest in tools and in experimented people that are specialized in those issues. But it's not always the case today, or at least not enough. We need to rely on experts. More than 50% of the companies located in France were cyber attacked. And on the European level, we also need to invest more in those issues. This is an absolute priority for the 2021-27 budget and the program for the digital space. The European Union wants to invest 1.6 billion euros in this field to fund infrastructure, cyber tools throughout the territory, but I think that this is not enough. The European market represents more than 130 billion euros, and it's evolving fast, more than 10% growth per year. And so I think we need to invest more in this issue, because if the goal is to really develop a strong European ecosystem, the European Union needs to invest more. And for the development of a safer digital space, we also need standards and reinforced norms. As stated in the white paper of the FIC last year, we also need to focus on the cyberspace. Of course, sanctions 
and regulations need to be a priority today. We also need to focus on IT vulnerabilities. We also need to follow the uh, work initiated by France to make sure that there is peace in the cyberspace and to limit the traffic of digital weapons. This way, we would be able to fight against cybercrime with more investment. So despite all of the challenges we really have to consider that those questions, those issues around cybersecurity, around a national digital strategy, the issue of collaboration between the ministries and territorial coordination are vital pillars to make sure that those policies are successful. I have talked about different items. I know that we have a lot of challenges ahead of us, and I entirely trust this edition of the FIC the partner of the region to move forward. Thank you for your attention. Have a nice uh, FIC and uh, I wish you a, a lot of luck for your endeavors in the region of France. You can stay with us. Go back to uh, go back on stage, please, with uh, Mr. Van der Berg, who is going to join us as well. And Anna Bernard the first uh, communication manager for the uh, metropolis of Lille. And I would like also to welcome the president of Eura Technologies to join on our stage. You can uh, come next to me. A small photograph first. We've been talking about this uh, for a long time, and so I'm very happy to be able to announce the creation of the first territorial campus. This is a very good opportunity for us, and uh, I'm very happy to give you this uh, certification for the first uh, Eau de France campus. As the president said, it was first an idea, and now we have a real project, and I'm very proud to start and to kick off this first territorial campus. Yes, this is now a reality, and the end it was quite easy, right? I wanted to thank you first and tell you that it's an honor to receive this uh, certification. It's also a strong catalyst. The region is well armed to face those challenges. We have the right infrastructures, we have the means, we also want to collaborate, and we have brilliant students in this metropolis as well, and I think we are going to rely on them very soon. And I really want for us to fight against this battle. We need to rely on all the companies on the territory. Together we are stronger, and the more numerous we'll be, the stronger we'll be together. A few words. First, I would like to thank all of those visionary people, because thanks to those visions, thanks to those presidents, so we have a metropolis president and a region president who really wanted to focus on cybersecurity measures, I really want to give them a round of applause, a big round of applause, because it's very rare to have elected officials making of cybersecurity a priority. We have an amazing ecosystem. You can come and see us at the stand of the region on the shop floor. Thank you very much. And to conclude, We've talked a lot on how to secure SMEs, and I think we really need to focus on proximity. So I would like all the other regional presidents to join our initiative. Thank you very much. We can maybe have a photograph of us all together without the microphones. Merci beaucoup, messieurs. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. We are reaching the end of our plenary session. At 4 p.m., we'll have another plenary session 
Is cybersecurity a sport like any other other sport? And we also have the uh, ceremony award. We'll also have a lot of conferences going on throughout the day. You'll have all the details in the FIC program. And you also have access to these conferences on the app. They are web streamed. We have the Cyber Commander Conference. And this plenary is available on the uh, YouTube channel in Cyber. Thank you very much and see you later for the next plenary session. Thank you.